Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video I gave an introduction to pre-filtering cube maps for image-based lighting. We discussed methods for sampling environment cube maps for the diffuse part of pre-filtering. Today we are going to look at both the shader code and the C++ code that perform the pre-filtering operation. But first I'm going to give a little demonstration of the new functionality that is added to the content tools and the level editor. I'll delete the old texture assets in our project. Let's import two equirectangular images as cube maps, making sure that we enable pre-filtering for both of them. After importing is done, we see four asset files saved in this location. We have the cube map as before, but this time we also have the pre-filtered diffuse texture. Opening the asset file, we see that now we have a new button that toggles between the diffuse and specular pre-filtered cube maps. At this time we don't have the specular part yet, so we have the original cube map instead. However, pressing the button displays the diffuse cube map. This is a 64 by 64 pixel cube map without MIP levels, and as we'll see in a later episode, it functions as a lookup texture for the diffuse part of the global lighting from the environment map. As we can see, there is little variation in this texture and therefore it would be fine to have a smaller size like 32 or even 16 pixel cube map. I chose a larger size so that's easier for us to see certain artifacts that can happen. Later I may change that to a smaller size. We also see that it has a BC6 image format, which can indicate that it has high dynamic range or HDR information. Here's another example with less high frequency lights, which results in a softer image. Note that these textures are linked together, and by opening either one, we also open the other. However, the import settings can only be changed for the specular part. Re-importing the image as a 2D texture and saving it, we see that the diffuse texture is removed. We can also rename either file and they'll still know where to find each other. And that's all I added for this episode. Now we can go and have a look at the code, starting with the compute shader. Here I added a new shader that's very similar to the conversion shader, which we already know from the previous episode. It takes the face index, which is given in the Z component of the group ID and the size of the cube map. Remember that we have a hard-coded size for pre-filtered cube maps, which is 256 pixels. We place ourselves in the center of the cube map so that each pixel position is between minus 1 and 1 in any direction. Then we can use the face index and the pixel position to get the direction vector for sampling the cube map. As we saw in the previous video, we can then sample an entire hemisphere using three methods. Here we see the shader in Visual Studio Code. Get sample direction cube map returns a normalized direction vector given the face index and the pixel position. It's similar to the one we used to get a direction vector for the equirectangular image. This time it makes more sense though as it follows Direct3D's cube map face ordering. As I mentioned, we have three sampling methods. Let's have a look at each one of them, starting with the discrete method. I already discussed the mathematics of these methods, so today we'll concentrate more on their shader code. All three functions only need a normal direction, which they'll use to determine the orientation of the hemisphere they'll sample. Here we construct a coordinate system such that the normal vector, or the sample direction, forms the z-axis. This is a 3x3 matrix that transforms the hemisphere to align with the direction of the normal vector. Then we have a for loop for phi, which goes around the hemisphere, and another for loop for theta, which goes from 0 to pi over 2. This corresponds to grazing angle at the ground and the pole of the hemisphere. 
We use the same delta for both parameters, but it's also okay to choose different step sizes. Using the sine and cosine of theta and phi, we can construct a direction vector in Cartesian world coordinates. This vector is transformed to the tangent frame I mentioned earlier, and the result is used for sampling the source cube map. The sampled value is attenuated by cos theta and scaled by sin theta. After sampling the entire hemisphere, we average the irradiance by dividing it by the total number of samples. We also multiply by pi because of the Riemann sum. Removing the compiled shaders in content tools and rebuilding the project will apply the changes we made to our shader and uses the discrete method instead of the brute force method. Reimporting the texture without bright light sources, we see that it looks okay as before. However, doing so for an image with tiny bright lights results in rather bad aliasing as expected. Now let's see what it looks like using important sampling. Here again we construct a tangent frame first. If the normal vector doesn't coincide with the z-axis in world space, then we can use the z-axis as the up vector, and taking the cross product with the normal vector will give us a direction that's perpendicular to both. Using this direction, we can compute another axis that's perpendicular to both normal and tangent x, thus forming an orthonormal coordinate axis. If the normal vector does coincide with the z-axis in world space, we use the x-axis for the up vector to calculate the other two axes. These three axes form the coordinate system that transforms the direction vector to the tangent frame of the normal direction. The number of samples is given by this member of the constant buffer. As we'll see later, this is set to 1024 samples. We use the Hammersley sequence to generate random numbers that are between 0 and 1. Here is an implementation of the function, which I copy-pasted from the internet. I didn't add a reference to the source, because everyone seems to be using this exact implementation, with the only difference being that this function is sometimes inlined in the Hammersley function. By the way, here we see the input resource for the shader, which is the cube map that was converted from the equirectangular image. As we saw in the last video, we can calculate phi and theta using this relation, which is a result of applying the theory of important sampling to this use case. We'll see how to derive these in the next episode. Similar to the discrete method, now we have the sine and cosine of both phi and theta, and we can use them in the same way for sampling the cube map. The sum of all samples is divided by the sample count at the end to average the irradiance value. Let's compile the shader again and see what this looks like. Oh, and I added the new compute shader to the batch file, so it gets compiled as well. Using important sampling, we see a little bit of noise in our image. However, we must remember that we are only taking 1024 samples as opposed to the 25,000 samples of the discrete method. The result for the image with tiny lights is even worse. Again, that's because the number of samples is relatively low, as we can see in the code somewhere, if I can find it. Yes, here. I'll explain this code later in the video. We can overwrite this in the shader with a higher sample count. For example, 64,000 samples. Recompiling the shader and reimporting the image, it now looks like this. It still has a bit of noise, but it's much better now and the image without small lights is perfectly smooth. Finally, we have the brute force method, which I chose to be the default method for pre-filtering for diffuse IBL.
Here we compute the normalized pixel position for all pixels of the entire cube map, but we'll only sample the pixels that are on the hemisphere in front of the normal direction. We can test for this using a simple dot product. We only read from the texture if the dot product is larger than zero. As I explained in the last video, projection of a cube onto a sphere results in a non-uniform sample density. Therefore, we calculate a weight that's called the differential solid angle or the texel solid angle and scale the sampled value with this weight. We also add all weight values together and divide the irradiance by the sum before returning it. Now let's have a look at the results using the brute force method. Again, delete the compiled folder to force recompiling shaders. And here we see the pre filtered texture. As expected, it has no noise whatsoever, since we are sampling the maximum amount of pixels that's present in the source cube map. We can see some irregularity in this area when I zoom in, but that's due to using block compression. It's better to save the pre-filtered textures in an uncompressed format. As you can see, re-importing it without compression gets rid of the artifacts. That's everything I added to the shader file. I'll show all additions again to make sure we didn't miss anything. So here is the input texture. Note that it's mapped to the same register as the equirectangular environment map, but since we access each one in a different compute shader, it will work just fine. Then there is the Hammersley function, followed by get sample direction cube map. Next are the three sampling functions and the helper function for constructing a tangent frame for the normal vector. And finally, the compute shader itself. I already showed the command file, so let's move on to envmapprocessing.cpp. Here we include the compiled shader bytecode as we did for the equirectangular to cube map conversion shader. Then I added a new function for running the compute shader. This is again similar to our cube map conversion function from before. Let's look at it with syntax highlighting so it's easier to read. Here we get the immediate context and some other texture data like the number of cube maps. Remember we can have multiple cube maps in the same texture asset. This time we need to create three textures. One for the source cube map that we want to pre-filter, one for the result and one for copying the result to CPU accessible memory. First we need to upload the source cube map. In DirectX 11 this is fairly simple. We fill in a texture 2D description and set the texture cube flag in order to enable texture cube sampling in the shader. We set pointers to texture pixel data and its row pitch in an array of subresource data and pass it along with the texture description to create texture 2D API function. This will create a texture resource using our data. Next, we create the pre-filter cube map that will contain the result. Note that we use a predefined size of 64 pixels. As I mentioned earlier, we can probably use 32 or 16 pixels just as well. We bind this texture to be used as an unordered access resource. This way we can write to it in our shader. The last texture is one that can be accessed by the CPU. This is similar to what we did in the cube map conversion function, so I'm not going to explain it in detail again. The compute shader is created using the new shader here. The constant buffer is also created in the same way. This time we passed the source cube map size and the size of the pre-filter cube map as well as the sample count, which is only used with important sampling. The linear sampler is also used here again and after resetting the pipeline, we are ready to dispatch the compute shader. So for each source cube map, we create a shader resource view of the cube map within the array of cube maps if we have more than one cube map. Otherwise, it's just an SRV of a cube map. The same goes for the pre-filtered cube maps. Here we create an unordered access view. This is the function that creates the SRV. And this one creates a UAV. Before dispatching, we compute the number of thread groups. We know that our compute shader runs in groups of 16 by 16 threads. So we have to find the group size that, when multiplied by 16, 
will cover the whole cube map phase. As we saw before, the number of phases is passed in the Z component, which is 6. After the for loop is run for all cube maps, we reset the pipeline and download the results. Again, we already went through that code in the past episodes, so I'm going to skip it here. And that's all I added in this CPP file. We are going to call this function in the texture importer. So here I added its function declaration. Then I added a new function that will prefilter one or more cube maps provided in texture data for either diffuse or specular part of the IBL. Of course, we haven't implemented the specular part yet. In that case, this function simply returns the original cube map. Again, let's have a look at it here where it's more readable. First, we check that prefilter cube map setting is true and that the texture data is delivered in an uncompressed format. After reading subresource data from the data buffer using this function, which we already know from previous videos, we also check that the texture is a cube map consisting of square images and that the data contains the full chain of MIP maps. I'll show you the log2 function a bit later in this video. Then we initialize a scratch image with our cube map data. I don't think there is a way of doing this directly from the array of images since we have MIP maps. That's why we copy them here manually. We already saw that the sample count for important sampling is hard coded at 1024. I didn't bother to make extra import settings to choose the sampling method and sample count since we are using brute force sampling, but obviously that would provide the user with even greater control over importing options. Next, we call either prefilter diffuse or prefilter specular, which will both run a compute shader. That's why this block of code is passed as a lambda expression to run on GPU function. Also, at this time, we just return OK for the specular part, since we are going to implement that later. The result is compressed if necessary and returned to the editor at the end. Here I added two new functions that we can call from the editor for diffuse and specular prefiltering. Again, when calling this second function, for now we just get back the original cube map. And finally, in the import function, we skip compression if the texture is a cube map that's meant for prefiltering. The compression will be done after prefiltering step. Also note that this part of the code is identical to this part, which is in the prefilter IBL function. Feel free to refactor it into a separate function. In this case, I didn't feel like it was worth doing it. And here is the enumeration that we use as a parameter for diffuse or specular prefiltering. Those were all the updates to textureimporter.cpp. The last bit of C++ code for this episode is here where I added the lock2 function. It probably only works with Microsoft C compilers, but the C++ standard library also provides a lock2 function which can be used as well. And that's all for today's video. In the next one, we'll go through the C-sharp code that will call the new functions and handles pairing of IBL textures in the editor. Thank you as always for joining me and I'll see you next time.